I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. So I'd like to talk with you about realistic optimism in your relationships. And this is related to the theme that we've been pursuing here for some months about how do we live together? Sometimes it can seem so difficult, actually, whether it's a son or a friend or a parent, a partner, a neighbor, uh, someone in the community, someone you work with, or those other people uh, that maybe we're tangled up with politically in one way or another, or those other people on the other side of the world. How do we live together, including as the single 8 billion member, whole human tribe? Wow. So we've been exploring that. Uh, tonight, I'd like to talk about, as I said, realistic optimism in our relationships. And at first, that might seem like a bit of a weird topic. Uh, bear with me. I think you'll find that this is actually really valuable, really useful. It certainly has been for me, including recently. Um, <clears throat> optimism is about the future. It's, it's an attitude, an expectation, an, an appraisal about how it will turn out, how you'll be able to cope with it, and what you'll be experiencing inside. And optimism tends to have, form those anticipations eh, tilted positively, realistically positively, that eh, most of the time, not perfectly, things will kind of sort of turn out often reasonably well in relationships. Uh, you'll be able to cope and you'll be okay in the core of your being. Now, let's to be clear, optimism is not delusion. The Buddha said a lot of things about ignorance and delusion uh, as the root of suffering. Uh, optimism is not about looking at the world through rose-colored glasses or turning away from sorrow or injustice or tragedy or serious challenges. Not at all. Optimism is not about being a chump in your relationships. Realistic optimism. One way to be realistically optimistic for example, is to build on what I talked about a few sessions ago about healthy mistrust in which we start to realize that a certain kind of person or a certain kind of situation is predictably problematic. So we form healthy mistrust about that person or situation and we disengage to some extent or we protect ourselves as best we can. So in the context of that realistic mistrust, we can become realistically optimistic to the extent possible that we'll be able to avoid those pitfalls with that other person. Interesting. There's a lot of research that shows that uh, the opposite of realistic optimism in a couple of key regards is not good for mental health. And it's actually also not good for our effectiveness, whether it's in our personal relationships or in the places where we work. And those two opposites, to some extent, of realistic optimism are learned helplessness and what's called defensive pessimism. These are major areas of research in psychology. Uh, Martin Seligman and colleagues probably 40, 50, 40 plus years ago, developed the notion of learned helplessness in which people can acquire a sense of defeat and anticipatory futility, anticipatory defeat. Like, uh, I can't do anything anyway. I don't have agency here. I'm the cue ball, not the eight ball. I'm the nail, not the hammer. Nothing I can do. And I'm not making fun of it. It's really important. We're very vulnerable. Mammals in general, including some of our cousins uh, in the mammal kingdom, such as, or queendom, really, uh, the dogs, uh, we're very vulnerable to acquiring a sense of entrapment, futility, and defeat. Nothing to do. Uh, on the other hand, 
that learned helplessness is a slippery slope to depression. Research has found, and learned helplessness also tends to make us give up too soon, when actually there are things we could do. We still have some moves left in the game. We still have some cards left in our hand, but we don't play them at all because we feel helpless from the get-go. Uh, learned helplessness also is a slippery slope to feelings of inadequacy and worthlessness, like, oh, I don't have any power. I'm no good. They have, you know, they can make things happen. Oh, I can't. It goes really fast to a sense of shame and inadequacy and worthlessness, which also then is a slippery slope to depression in effect, as a factor in its own right. Also, there's what's called defensive pessimism. I think about it as a preemptive strike against disappointment. It's the person who says, you know, I'm just going to expect the worst. Then I'm never disappointed. <laughs> or, oh, I'm going to go out on that date, or I'm going to do that job interview, and I'm just going to basically figure that, you know, it's not going to work out for me. Or I'm going to do something early on because I just can't tolerate waiting for the other shoe to drop. So I'm gonna create an upset with this other person or I'm gonna do something at work. And yeah, you know, that'll con when the negative stuff then happens, that will confirm my negative pessimism. So I can have the comfort uh, of thinking that I was right. And yeah, and the comfort of confirming my views, confirming my biases. Well, here too, defensive pessimism, you know, it's, it's a way, it's a way to maintain some kind of well-being by sort of being really quite defended and, and um, pessimistic or skeptical about what the future might hold. On the other hand, uh, it's not a prescription for long-term well-being and, a, you know, a kind of, it's not a prescription either for healthy ambition and striking out in various ways. If you're pessimistic about the results, you're gonna be less inclined to make the investment of time or energy uh, or effort and heart to help things be better. The alternative to these is what I'm calling realistic optimism, which helps us uh, feel better in the present because we're having a more optimistic anticipation of the future it also, in our relationships in particular, just shifts how we feel about them. To give you a personal example that I'm going to kind of buff the edges of to uh, remove any identifying details, someone in sort of my close circle, friends, family, etc., I got into a bit of a wrangle with yesterday. And we both, I think, kind of stumbled into it. We were sort of stressed about a technical issue with some equipment we were dealing with. It was frustrating to, fight, to try to figure it out. And uh, there was a little bit of blame floating around on either side, I, I admit it to myself, a little bit of certainly some irritability flying around. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to my chance tomorrow with this person to clean it up, to talk it through. I know we're going to be having a chance to talk with each other, which I am really looking forward to. So I just noticed inside my own mind, if I imagine going into this interaction with this person who's important to me, really important to me, uh, tomorrow, and I go into it thinking, it's probably not going to go very well. I'm not going to know what to say. They're probably going to be kind of cranky and mean and uptight or defensive. If they are, I won't know really what to do. I'm just kind of pessimistic about it. How does that feel? doesn't feel that good. Ooh. A. B. If I'm feeling that way, I'm not going to tend to be very resourceful in my mind about thinking through different things I could say, different things I want to make sure I don't say. Uh, you know, I'm not going to be very good at sort of imagining the zone I want to be in, the way of being. That's the center from which everything else originates. What's the zone, the way of being in your body and your mood and your sensibility, your, your attitude overall, your sense of yourself, the you that you are, the you that you show up as in a particular interaction? You know, how do you want that to be? Um, 
if I'm going into the interaction, if you're going into your version of these interactions uh, with someone important to you and you're bleh, pessimistic and glum and kind of already defeated going in, you're not going to be very resourceful in thinking about and kind of setting yourself up for your best odds of success going in. On the other hand, I have found really for myself, because I started practicing with this for this particular interaction that I'm going to be having tomorrow, um, I found for myself that when I kind of nudged my mind gently into a realistically optimistic direction, and I'm going to be really getting at that key word, realistic. You probably caught me on that, right? That, oh yeah, Rick's hedging his bets here. That word is pretty important. Um, you know, if I'm if I go into that this interaction tomorrow and I think about it now more optimistically, like, yeah, you know, usually when I've talked with this person, it's sort of sorted out. And it hasn't always been easy, but it's we've ended usually in a decent place. And um, yeah, um, you know, I, I, I kind of can trust myself. I'm going to stay calm. I'm going to stay in a good place. I'm going to for sure cop to my part. You know, I'm going to definitely uh, take responsibility for and go to the maximum reasonable extent on acknowledging my part. I can trust myself to do that. And I can trust myself to listen well. Uh, these are things that are going to increase the odds of success. Well, when I have this attitude, a more optimistic attitude, for one, I feel better. I can already know I'm going to sleep better tonight. And also, I think I'll perform better. I'll be more effective in an authentic sense uh, when we have this interaction. And you might think to yourself here about key interactions uh, that you have with people or maybe that you're going into uh, and ask yourself, huh, do a little thought experiment. Attitude one, attitude two. Pessimism, optimism. And so imagine looking at an interaction or a situation through the lens of pessimism. Okay, how's that feel? And then do the exercise where you go the other way. You look at it through the lens of realistic optimism. Oh, how does that feel? Now, I want to underline what I mean by realistic. And then I want to talk with you about uh, some things that can help us to develop this realistic optimism in our relationships and undo, uh, if it's relevant to you, and it is for, I think, the majority of people, undo um, forms of learned helplessness or defensive pessimism that may have been useful back then or reasonable back then, but are not so useful or reasonable today. I'm going to get into some practical things you can do. But first, I really want to unpack what in the world do I mean by realistic? I've been seeing some things coming in through the chat, certainly about really difficult situations in which there's you know, the basis for realistic optimism is, is very, very small. And inside this very, very small space, you can be realistically optimistic that, um, if this is even a way to say it, that there's really just nothing you can do. I'm not sure that's optimistic. To be clear, if, you know, the last four times you've tried to talk with someone and you've really been present, you've been solid, you've been skillful, you've been your real self, you've been, you know, in a good zone, as I used that word previously, and that person just bam, 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 bats away the open hand of peacemaking, and bam, 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 just can't get off it and their position, and they have zero interest in um, hearing you out, and in fact, they, they're motivated clearly to punish you somehow for daring to bring anything up? Well, one strike, yeah, two strikes, sometimes a person's just out, four strikes. I think you're kind of seeing something there. So for sure, I'm, I'm not talking about being optimistic when it's ridiculous. Optimism basically is about placing your bet. Do you think there's, you know, better than a 51% chance, a 51% chance or better that things will kind of sort of turn out 
ish, ish kind of well in the world, in how you act, and in how you feel. Ish. And a key point here, in realistic optimism, we can recognize that the odds of a good outcome in the world, including in that other person, might be really low. And so in terms of how the other person might be or react, we could be realistically pessimistic, right? We could think, er, not too much of a chance there. But super important, we can be realistically optimistic about how we will conduct ourselves, how we will be, how we will regulate ourselves internally, how we will speak, how we will help ourselves to rest in you know, these three descriptions of someone who really is awakening that I love from the Buddha, someone who is peaceable, friendly, and fearless friendly in ways that are appropriate to the situation, which might take the form of, of a simple civility and little more. Can we rest in that, right? We can be realistically optimistic of how we will be, how we will conduct ourselves inside our minds with our words and with our deeds, and we can be realistically optimistic about what we will experience as we interact with this other person, and afterward. We can be realistically optimistic that we will walk away, you know, maybe a little sad or disappointed while still feeling good about ourselves, that we did our best and um, protected and nurtured in the core of our being with, as we explored in the meditation, underneath it all, an ongoingness of connection with being, with beingness as the ground of doing and ultimately opening into you know, the ground of reality altogether. So that's what I mean, especially by realistic optimism. We can become overly fixated in the results out there in the world, including inside the black box of the mind of other people. And then, of course, we have very limited influence there. So realistic optimism in that regard might be fairly conservative, while at the same time, we can have a quite expansive sense of realistic optimism in how we will act and, and be in our core and what we will experience you know, during and after important interactions with other people. That's what I mean by realistic and optimistic. I find that's a wonderful distinction to recognize that very often it's likely to turn out badly in the world or it's likely to remain problematic in the world, just the momentum of all the forces of history in, at all levels, while at the same time being very deservedly optimistic about how you will operate, how you will act and how you will be, and optimistic about what you will feel inside deep in your core of being, certainly. So how to do it, how to do it, practical, right? How to do it, how do we do this? First, I find it's really helpful to have the attitude of don't know. Now you might say, well, Rick, optimism is a kind of knowing. Like, oh, I, I and it's not a kind, it's not really knowing, it's more like not knowing, but figuring kind of the odds are a certain way. Uh, and to undo defensive pessimism and learned helplessness, it's really useful to just say, well, don't know. I'm gonna run the experiment. Instead of feeling helpless, let's say, or defensively pessimistic about an appointment with a doctor to talk about a health issue, especially if you have a history of health issues, it could be understandable to acquire a sense of helplessness and to protect yourself by being deliberately pessimistic about what you'll gain from the next meeting, right? Instead of that helplessness or pessimism, you could say, you know, I don't know. I'm not saying that it's gonna turn out well, 
but I just don't know. And I'm going to run an experiment. I'm going to see, and I'm going to let the jury of reality, in effect, render a verdict, like in terms of what might happen. Now that all it doesn't mean then that you set yourself up to fail. It means that you give yourself the best chance within the frame of don't know, not knowing, beginner's mind, as Suzuki Roshi put it. You're still going to make efforts to help you know things turn out well and you know increase the odds of them turning out well. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. But this the freedom of don't know. You walk into an interaction with a someone you love and with whom you've had a tiff. And it's really helpful to go, don't know. That gives them room to breathe. Increases the odds of success. It, give, it kind of pulls you out of familiar scripts of reactivity to create more of the buffer of don't know. Don't know. Don't know. It pulls us out of attachment to views. It pulls us out of labeling others and sticking them in little boxes in our mind. Oh, yeah, you, the jerk, or you, oh, the doctor, or you, you know, my ex, or you, you know, my partner um, in this business here. You know, it pulls us out of those roles. You, you know, the X, Y, or Z. And we're like, don't know. Okay, don't know. Second, really helps to have accurate appraisals of yourself. Most people's, my experience, self-appraisals are wildly inaccurate in terms of things like their capacity to endure, their capacity to tolerate discomfort and keep going, um, wildly underestimating their, their goodness, their virtuousness, the sincerity of their heart, their good intentions, the ways that they're fundamentally a decent, kind person especially when they're not when their hair's not on fire um, you know we tend to really underestimate ourselves we don't have an accurate sense of our coping capabilities our resources and what we could do we might need to stretch a bit or take a chance and might be a little ragged around the edges or your performance is not yet perfect but still we're good enough to go we're good enough to get out there really important as a practical thing, uh, it can be very helpful with someone who is feeling insecure or inadequate, including in um, going out in the dating world or doing other kinds of things with other people, going out on job interviews or just interacting, uh, to kind of make a list of your character strengths. You know, they're via values in action, VIA. You can do online surveys to identify key character strengths or different models of character strengths and other virtues. You know, it's to list some of your good qualities or things you can trust in or that are the basis for realistic optimism, especially in the two regards I've said, how you will, how you will be in act and what you'll be experiencing along the way and afterward. Um, so yeah, seeing yourself accurately not underestimating yourself. Third, being very aware of the long shadow of the negativity bias, going all the way back to early childhood, the learning of helplessness, the learning of pessimism, the learning of self-criticism. You know, there you are, you interact with other people, and nine out of 10 times, it turns out well. One time, it was weird, awkward, you know, you weren't at your best, you kind of blew it, you stumbled, okay. Well, that means your next interaction probably has a 90% chance of success. But the negativity bias tells us that one in 10, 10 overrules the other nine, right? Watch out for that. And be aware of how even single episodes could sting so much. I think back on things that happened. I remember right now sitting in the bleachers in high school when my friend's girlfriend turned to me and just out of the blue, kind of out of the blue, was really scornful of me. And it just hit me really hard because I was pretty vulnerable. I didn't have a lot of sense of worth at the time uh, as a you know, young guy in high school. And ugh, you know, it really landed hard. I, I can think about you know, interactions with authority figures or being, you know, sort of dismissed out of a group, a little events, right? They can really land big on us. And here we are today, 40, 50 years later, still playing really small because that one event really zapped us. 
and we are still carrying it. You know, um, it's that's normal to do. The brain's designed to learn from experiences, especially if they're negative, especially if they happen with when we're young, and especially negative experiences when we're young with other people. We're over designed to learn from those to help our ancestors make it through a day in the Stone Age or back on the Serengeti Plains or back in Jurassic Park. So um, it's normal. Wow, try to be aware of that long hand, of the negativity bias, shaping and um, ruining your opportunities for the benefits of realistic optimism. Okay, so so far, we have, if you want to help yourself, we have don't know, that attitude of not knowing, beginner's mind, child mind, fresh mind, not duh, but don't know. Huh, let's see, don't know, maybe so. Second, uh, accurate appraisal of yourself, your capabilities, who you are, and your capacities to keep on trying and muddle forward, you know, in a good way. Third, recognizing long hand long shadow of negative experiences, the negativity bias, over learning from painful experiences. Okay. Fourth thing you can do to help yourself enjoy the benefits of realistic optimism in your relationships, do your homework, take action, uh, help yourself, you know, reach out to allies, read a book or two, read a fortune cookie even, about ways to be skillful in relationships. Give a little thought to maybe ways you've stumbled in the past and use that as an opportunity for learning, not as an opportunity for reinforcing your overly negative self-concept. Uh, you know, make, make efforts. We can, we can develop realistic optimism about things if we know that we're going to be trying, we're gonna be doing things, we're gonna be acting. Uh, there's no replacement. Uh, for action. Uh, I was reading a quotation recently from Angelus Arian, um, um, and wonderful teacher who said, um, let's see, ac the way I remember it is action binds anxiety. I think she might have said it slightly differently. Um, but it's as we act, we can really serve ourselves. So think about what you could actually do in relationships. You know, Maybe that means uh, stopping certain behaviors. You know, one of my takeaways with regard to this uh, wrangle I got into is to not do certain things. Uh, again, uh, not set things up in a certain way, which then led us into trouble. And when the oatmeal hits the fan, don't get a little snappish, even when other people are, right? Okay, so if not doing certain things is a mode of action that can be very skillful, what might help? You know that the what in that regard, what what could you stop doing that would help your interactions go better, and what could you do more? Of, right? Action, and then fifth and last, stay in the game. <laughs> stay in the game. Uh, yes, there's a point where we form healthy mistrust about an interaction or a person where we call it quits, or we step out of a certain topic or we step back from a depth of connection. Uh, we create a boundary, we create a, a buffer maybe between us and other people. We disengage in some ways. Uh, you know, in the book of mine that's coming out in January, I talk about resizing the relationship sometimes. There's a place for that, absolutely a place for that. Definitely a place for not letting ourselves be sucked into repetitive scripts with other people that are abusive to us or harmful to us or bad models for other people, including children sometimes, who are watching. Absolutely. On the other hand, very often <laughs> a person, and I can think of myself in lots of ways, will kind of, uh, you know, make a little bit of an entry into an interaction or a situation or let's say a group. Uh, and then unless there's absolutely perfect responsiveness, gold standard responsiveness from the other person or the group, bleh, we disengage, we step out, we quit, we drop our tennis racket and get off the court. Instead, very often, stay in the game. You know, you, you say something, 
Interactions are like volleys in tennis or ping pong. You say something, they say something. You say something, they say something or do. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And keep the ball in play. So often, that's the real issue, actually. A person will make a couple of forays and, you know, another person gets a little irritable or cranky or inattentive or attention wanders. And instead of keeping the the volley going, the interaction going and guiding sometimes or pulling for, you know, better behavior or some involvement in the other person, we give up based on our often defensive pessimism and learned helplessness. And um, so instead, really think about, huh, one, one basis for realistic optimism is that you know that up to the point when it's true, up to the point that, you know, it's time to, it's time to call it. I didn't mean to move. You're not going to cut your throat. Certainly not. But, you know, it's time to call it. It's time to call it quits or it's time to fold your hand. Uh, it's time to recognize that dog won't hunt. It's just a different kind of creature. Whatever it might be, up to that clear point, one way to support realistic optimism is to stay in the game, is to keep trying, staying engaged. Uh, continuing to nudge appropriately uh, to help things turn out as reasonably well as they can. Okay, so I hope this was useful. This is a very fresh topic. I haven't heard anyone else talk about it. Uh, I haven't talked about it. Um, so at 7 p.m., uh, top of the hour, Lynn made a comment, and I'll, I'll use your name if you're if you use your name publicly, you may, if you chat me privately, I won't use your name. So Lynn points out, there are people who seek to punish us. They do exist, even those closest to us. I think that's totally true. We can rest in compassion and kindness as much as possible. We can certainly uh, help hostility and, and righteousness not invade us and possess us, while also being discerning, seeing clearly, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, has webbed feet like a duck, has little ducklings behind it. Yeah, that's a duck. We can be discerning and we can have clear values that say, for example, that people who are, that we discern as just motivated to punish us, those are people in our value stack that we want to disengage from. And we don't think that's a good thing in general, and we don't operate that way ourselves. We can have values. In other words, just because we're discerning and have values doesn't necessarily mean that we are othering other people uh, in problematic ways. So yeah. And one thing I find that supports realistic optimism is to know that you can trust yourself to see clearly over time, especially, and not invest in interactions with people where you have every right, every reason to have a realistic expectation that they're, it's not going to go well with them. So great. Okay, let's see. Okay. Um, this Great comments coming in. Um, so someone made a comment to me that said essentially that they were accused, quote unquote, sometimes of being unduly pessimistic or over pessimistic. But this person sees it as being realistic. And I want to be clear too. Um, sometimes our hopefulness or childlike innocence, naivete, optimism can be abused by others, exploited by others, because they have a certain type of person who can kind of see us as a mark. And I'm not saying that we should be that way at all. And um, whether whatever they accuse us of or say we are, whatever, for you, if you find value in what I'm talking about tonight, find your own way to be realistically optimistic in the ways I'm talking about. Uh, and if you feel that that would be valuable for you, uh, I can say for me, uh, particularly as I've kind of clarified it through talking about it with you all, I can really see how valuable that is for me. Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, Naomi uh, to unmute yourself. Hi, Naomi. You have to unmute yourself here. Great. No, not yet. 
Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Great. Oh, how great to be here. My Zoom wasn't working for a while, and I really miss particularly you yeah. and this group. Uh, um, thank you very much for tonight's uh, talk and all of them, because it's extraordinary, this whole practice. Somehow, anytime I do it here or with my New York group, something always touches me at the moment that I needed it. And so tonight is one of those things. I'll try to make that quick. I think I'd like to believe that I, when I meet new people, I always act with 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 uh, optimistic realism, and and so. But sometimes, and, and my son is the same way, you know. And my immediate family that I had any influence on is like this. Uh, and sometimes there are people who take it as if we're, you know, being very fresh or very rude. Like for um, part of my family is from England. I uh, um, hosted an English cousin. She was nowhere near any of us, very reserved. And to her, this was almost frightening. Uh, so I had to learn how to re relate to her a little sure. bit differently. And but is there a question in this? Yeah. So the question is, what happens as a result when I don't get the same feedback of back? I get I don't get back. Um, you know, positive, optimistic realism, I feel there's something wrong with me. Did I overdo it? Am I, uh, you know, like I immediately uh, think that I'm overdoing it and and I'm wrong. I'm too uh, right. fresh and too, and so, so the question is, how, is there a level where I have to lower this expectation? Right, right. I, this is very good, Naomi. Thank you. And deep. Uh, if I understand it right, and kind of I'm going to generalize a little bit, uh, there's the aspect that I'm talking about here of how we appraise things. And then there's the dimension of how we act with others. Okay. So it may be that one person's style, even culturally, like I have kind of a California style, and that culturally can be seen as too mellow, too laid back. If someone comes from kind of a hard charging, I guess I think about New York culture as I mainly experience it, right? And let's say you, you're kind of open and large hearted and just sort of ebullient. You're feeling pretty good and you're naturally expressive and engaged and cheerful and upbeat. And to another person, let's say who comes from a different kind of culture that maybe culturally tends to be sort of defensively grim and you know contracted to prevent disappointment it can feel abrasive okay well inside yourself you can be realistically optimistic about relationships while at the same time adjusting your style maybe you're kind of a cha-cha person da, 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 you know and then you got this other person who's like this really slow waltzer and you may need to if you want slow it down to get into rapport with, you know, so you're attuned to rhythmically even their waltzing in a way that's not inauthentic. It's just, oh, they like to waltz. And I'm going to adjust my cadence, my pace, my mood, uh, my implicit bids. I'm pulling for things implicitly. They don't like that I'm pulling for things implicitly just by being kind of upbeat and interested and talkative and gregarious. Okay, with them, if I want to, I, Naomi, I can choose to dial it down into waltz mode. You know, you could do all these things while still being sincere in who you are and, you know, and choosing to be with people who are more in the cha cha mode in general. Thank you. But just the other part, very quick. What you also said is, is that something about our childhood, you yeah. know, we've learned things. So, you know, in, in listening to you, I remember that when I was a child, I was left alone and a, a horrible thing happened. A building across the street exploded and there was a lot of death and everything. And I was alone. I was six years old. But oh. then my mother came hysterical. Never mind. It all went well. But ever since that time, I'm very afraid to be alone, even to this yeah. day. So I'm in an apartment building. There are people here, but over COVID, there were no people. Mm. And and so I think sometimes I, I have higher expectation when I do, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, this uh, optimistic because I want them to do the same with me and never leave me alone. Yeah. Well, it's then you're getting at a really delicate thing. And I mean, I don't know if it's true for you. I, I can know where we adopt a certain attitude that's designed in some ways to elicit a particular response from others. And we got to be a little careful about that, right? There's a reasonable place for trying to, you know, get what we need, but um, sometimes we can lose our balance. We can tip a little too far into performance or something that's a little too much to to get from others. And humans, I, you know, there's a really wide range of intellectual ability just innately, okay, just like there's a wide range of athletic ability, okay? But I think there's a pretty narrow range in human beings uh, of being able to recognize and feel viscerally where another person's coming from. And if other people sense that we're kind of, you know, trying to get from them with our upbeat spirit so they'll stick around, then a lot of people will pick up on pick up on that and they may tend to disengage. I don't know if that fits, but that's been a teaching for me. Okay, awesome. I'm gonna keep going. Thanks, Naomi. Naomi in New York. I like New York a lot, by the way. I'll be crystal clear. Okay, so you're you got to mute, go mute your, okay, I'm going to, you, you'll mute yourself. Okay, I'll actually, I'll do it real fast. Great. Okay, so Lynn, I'm going to keep rolling because I want to get, so Lynn with an E, it's my wife's middle name. Then I'm going to get to Lynn with no E on the end. So you got to unmute and turn your camera on if you can, if you don't mind. Hi, good morning, Rick. Um, hey there. Hi, I'm yeah calling in from Singapore. So it's, it's ah, morning. Ah, hello. Okay. What's your question? Yeah, a um, couple of questions. So uh, just kind of go off uh, quite no, direct. Please be succinct. Uh, pick one. Pick one. Okay. Um, I guess they're kind of interrelated. I think my question is um, what's the fine line between setting yourself up for failure versus going in with an I don't know mine? Um, how do we avoid trying to fix an outcome or rewrite the conclusion of an outcome? And when you talk about realistic optimism, what I, I find it difficult to not veer into blindsided optimism at times. Mm. These are my questions. Oh, very good. I think first, it really helps to know what our blind spots are. Like myself, I tend toward having a kind of childlike, innocent naivete. <laughs> And I've been blindsided by certain kinds of people uh, when if I just had been a little more perceptive, discerning, uh, I could have seen it coming instead of getting bonked upside the head uh, by them betraying me in some way or abandoning me or cutting me off in some way. And so I think if recognizing your blind spots, that really, really helps. Uh, second, in the don't know mind, we're still absorbing information like a very receptive sponge, like a vacuum cleaner. In a funny kind of way, don't know mind actually widens our perceptual frame. So we start picking up more information about reality. So, it, so which supports our realism, our realisticness in our appraisals and, and expectations. So you can have don't know mind you know, about what might happen next, while also being kind of really clear about your blind spots and protecting them and seeing very clearly along the way, you know, what's happening. Uh, yeah. Is that clear? What do you think? Does that answer? Yeah, I, I, I think what you said about if we know our blind spots and can be a bit more perceptive. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's a little hard when, when there are places inside us that wants to maybe um, rewrite the conclusion of an outcome or, um, you know, still holding out the hope that um, oh. other people sees us maybe, you know, and, and I guess where, how do we balance that? Oh, yeah. I mean, here too, uh, you know, 
we um, there's this, as you said, this balance between um, intending the best and hoping for the best without being attached to what could happen and without trying to get blood from a stone. We have a tendency often to keep repeating scripts from our childhood of frustration and defeat because they're familiar and we're trying to succeed finally at that quest the 10th time or the 100th time that in our childhood or earlier just never turned out well. And there's, there, it's understandable, but we can get trapped in those kind of quests. In again, in certain kind, chasing certain kinds of relationships with certain kind of people. That realistically, it's just the odds are incredibly low. It's probably never going to happen with that kind of person, that kind of relationship, something. And um, I think a lot. Maybe I'll just finish with this point. I, I think about where are we trying to grow our flowers and fruit, right? Are we trying to grow them in rich soil or are we just bound and determined to, to grow that fruit tree, that apple tree in stony ground? You know, and we're getting, we get involved with kind of heroic effort with fertilizer and water and pruning and protection to try to make something happen. And it would just be better to put our efforts, to, to cast our seeds and bring our fertilizer to a different kind of soil. And that's a kind of a poignant thing to think about, you know, maybe long term. Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, I, re I really wish you well. And I'm so glad you came in from Singapore. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> really. Thank you, Rick. Yeah. Okay. Lynn Harbaugh, we'll finish up. I'll be kind of quick here. I've asked you to unmute. Great. Okay. Um, hi, Rick. I'm in Calgary. Hey, <laughs> Not Calgary. as far away as Singapore. <laughs> yeah. um, so here's my question. Uh, you were talking about the learned pessimism. Um, I was raised in a family where I was ridiculed, denigrated daily, mm -hmm. and I'm aware of it. I know what it is. I know where it came from. I've spent decades yeah. working and working and working and working. I don't even know what my question is other than does it ever end? Well, that's a question or what to do about it. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I, I'm first. I'm really sorry that that happened. You know, I think we've talked a bit before about this. You know, here in the in the meditation gathering. So yeah, I have a feeling for what you're talking about. Um, one thing I would just maybe offer is that legacy, which gets kind of. Um, burned into us when we're young, right? You know, uh, I am I hold out the hope as a psychologist and as a person of practice that we truly can erase the emotional impact of those memories. And actually, this is not an area that I'm an expert on at all. There's growing evidence with psychedelic assisted well done therapies, including for really similar, many kinds of trauma, including the ones you experienced, um, that can actually bring to a complete release. We don't forget what happened, but the charge on it starts to really dissipate. Maybe there's it's still- It's the charge, that's the, that's the word. Yeah. yeah, maybe the mood, the feeling, the charge, the affect, the emotion, yeah, can really start to massively release. So I'm very hopeful about that. That said, meanwhile, what we can do is get more and more distance from it so that it's like depressed mood or it's like back pain. We, we try to get some, di some distance from it. It's there. We wish it weren't there, and it's, but we can get distance from it. That's really important. So then we, we depersonalize it. It's not me. I have it. I am not it. Right, it's there. Quick ex yeah, a quick example here. Some couple of things that have happened in my building, uh, an apartment building. Um, it's a non-smoking building, and so I've approached a few people about non-smoking and asking them not to, and being sort of self-righteous. And my normal way to react would be bad people, 
But then I've encountered them other places in the building and ended up just visiting with them. And sort of like, oh, I can do this. Like, like a yeah. shift somehow in me. Great. Not having to respond from sort of the self-righteous, you know, you're going to hurt me kind of thing because you're going to smoke and I don't want to smell it. To joking with them. And does that make sense? It's sort of this dichotomous thing that's kind of trying to come together that I could be both. Very, very good. You're you're acting out that I'm hearing you say you're you're acting in ways that are outside the script. You're writing, you're writing new scripts. <laughs> you're the director and screenwriter and star of your own movie. Very, very, very important. You're getting some distance from those old ways of being and creating more um, evidence, more in, you know, again and again and again, one drop in the bucket after another, one synapse at a time, evidence for new ways of being that in the fancy lingo disconfirm those old experiences. Like that was then you, you're getting more and more distance from it. Yeah, that's that's a great one. That's a great one. Okay, I'm gonna scoot, but this was a really nice way to finish up. Thank you, Lynn from Calgary. <laughs> you take care. All right. You too. Thank you. Okay, everyone, that covered a lot of ground. I hope that was helpful for you, uh, and I'm looking forward to learning maybe next week what you have learned as you practice with this territory of realistic optimism.